So good evening. Thank you everyone for joining tonight. This is SAT 101. So everything you need to know about the SAT and more. My name is Tal Ketron. I'm with Apple Ruth and have been with the company for about 10 years now in various capacities. Uh, today I'm coming to you from just outside of Boulder, Colorado. And uh, my job now is just as an online premium tutor. So I work with students full time, primarily on SAT, PSAT and ACT. Uh, and so today we're just going to talk a bit about the test itself and break it down and then answer some questions you might have. I'll get you out of here within the hour. Uh, there's a question and answer function. Feel free to throw in questions as you go and I'll get to those at the end. And then there's also rumor has it closed captioning is available. So if that's something that um, would be beneficial, Zoom has enabled that. We should be able to get that to work as well. So let's talk a bit. We're going to start way back with the origins of the SAT. And we're not going to spend too much time there. We're going to move on to content tested and then testing plan, which is what's relevant for most of us as parents or students. Uh, and then again, I'm happy to answer questions at the end. So let's talk about how the SAT came to be. This was news to me when I learned it a year ago. In 1926, a, a Princeton professor, Carl Brigham, developed the very first SAT which at that time I believe stood for Scholastic Aptitude Test. Since then it has changed and now stands for nothing. There is no uh, acronym. And in 1947, ETS, which is Educational Testing Services was established because SAT was very popular as uh, a metric to standardize admissions. Then in 1959, University of Iowa professor Everett Franklin Lindquist created the ACT as a competing test. There's a presentation on that on Thursday. Uh, for decades, schools on the coast preferred the SAT and the Heartland, the ACT. Growing up in Illinois, we were required to, to take the ACT. And then as I taught in Atlanta, I realized all my students from New York, many of them had no idea what an ACT was because it was SAT country. Nowadays, it's about 50-50 in terms of how many people take each test. And another question I get a lot just as a tutor is, does it, is there a preference? Should I submit an SAT score and ACT score? That does not matter. So as students, what we wanna do is pick the test that's best for us. We'll talk about how to evaluate that. There's a lot of different things that come into play, but there's not gonna be a college that accepts the SAT and not the ACT. And there won't be a college or university that weights one differently. So we don't have to worry about that. Some more recent changes and future changes. Uh, even just since I've been exposed to the test, I think I took it back in 2002, it's changed a lot. So at that point, it was out of 1600, but very vocab based, 10 sections, all short. In 2006, it changed to a three part test, 2400 points with an essay that's mandatory. In 2012, the ACT actually passed the SAT, which I think made College Board act and say we've got to change, become more like the ACT. So then they changed it back to a two-part test, very similar to ACT, essay optional. Now the SAT has actually been done away with, so that's not on this timeline. So the SAT writing portion is no more. There is one for the ACT, but it's kind of going by the wayside. And in 2024, Apple Ruth is kind of keeping its finger on the pulse of this change. SAT is going totally digital. Uh, there have been some digital tests given as, as pilots, both internationally and in the US. But the test is going to change a lot. It's going to become shorter, shorter passages. Uh, likely this won't affect those of you in today's presentation, unless you're in the high school class of 2025 or beyond. So it will change, but for now we're dealing with what we've got, which is nice because since 2015, 16, there's a lot of material to build off of. So we can know what to expect with the current essay. I'm going to stay on this page for a little while because I think it's super important. You see, these are the major, I mean, timing constraints and major differences between ACT and SAT. If I was to boil it down, I would say that the SAT is a more challenging and more analytical test, but it wants you, to, the writers want you to know a lot about a little, meaning uh, you have to be an algebra expert and uh, there are certain grammar rules that you have to master but it's not as many questions and you get more time for them. So it's not a time crunch. It's just a little bit more challenging. Some students like that. Others who like to move quickly uh, and deal with also simpler material would probably prefer the ACT. And 
On the ACT, I think the, the theme is you need to know a little bit about a lot. So in the math section, 60 questions, 60 in 60 minutes. Uh, on ACT reading and science, you get 40 questions in 35 minutes. So it's really fast paced. And, and that can be a struggle for a lot of students. But the math is different on ACT. They want you to know, hey, what's a logarithm? Here's a point. You remember matrices, here's another point. Whereas the SAT is going to hammer in factoring and a lot of the heart of algebra, like coordinate points. The other thing about ACT is they don't give you geometry formulas, and of course they test geometry a lot. Um, but yeah, those are the big ones. Something to keep in mind as we look at the NACAC or NACAC factors and admissions, test scores are important, but they are not the only thing. Test scores do not define us. Uh, test scores can make up you know, in a way for a, a low GPA, but it's not going to be a panacea, right? Grades in your courses, especially college prep or AP, how strong was your curriculum? What were your extracurriculars like? Uh, your personal statements now have become very important because oops, the writing portion of the test is not given much weight. anymore. So our personal statements are going to be quite a bit more. important. So just know this is one piece of the puzzle. It's an important one, but it's not everything. So let's get into it. The SAT scored out of 1600. This would be what you would see from, uh, for example, a baseline mock test that you take with Aperuth. What comes up on a student's uh, web or account page, same for me as the tutor, is a full report. Questions that we missed, questions we got right, what types of questions, where am I losing points, and so on. So here's just an overall breakdown. This student scored a 750 on verbal, 660 on math, and so the score is just combining those. All the subscores and cross scores, we don't get that much out of that. We'll get more out of the certain question types that people are struggling with. This is a very strong score. It'd probably be 97th percentile, 96th percentile, something like that. And it's equivalent to an ACT score of about a 31. So a very strong score. And of course, what makes up a strong score would be very different for each individual. So I get that question a lot as a tutor. What's a good score? Well, where are we starting? And how much prep have you had? And what are our goals as far as colleges and so on? So a good score is very much in the eye of the beholder. But this would be, like I said, 96, 97 percentile, very high score. Breaking down this EBRW, the reading and writing score. What they do is they grade it out of 40 for reading and writing. And then they add those two numbers together and add a zero at the end. So the maximum score you could get on writing is a 40. This person did that by going perfect, 44 out of 44, which we see there. Uh, reading, we missed six, and that cost us 50 points. What that shows is because all SATs are graded on a curve, that's how they're standardized. So you're graded on a curve with everyone else taking the same test as you nationally, sometimes internationally. And what this means is, at the top of the curve, it's pretty harsh. Every question is basically worth 10 points. That's what I see here. Six questions missed, 50 points lost. That's why it's so rare to get a perfect score. So 46 to 52 is wonderful. That's an outstanding score. We're missing one or two per passage maximum. And of course, can't argue with perfect. Um, but it just goes to show you that to be perfect on SAT, you really can't miss a question, maybe one or two total. Um, so you can see here that We've got our breakdown of 35 plus 40, so 750. The way it works on math, and we'll get into this a little bit more deeply as far as the sections, is very similar. Uh, in this case, it's out of 40, and then they just double it and add a zero. So don't worry too much about that. You can see here the raw score of 43 out of 58 is 15 missed questions, and that costs us 140 points. So from 800 to 660, because we missed 15 math problems, that means the curve is about the same. Every question missed at a high level is worth 10 points. And then that curve will even out as we go down. So 15 misses, 140 points lost, still a great score. This is where we can get a lot out of this as a student or a tutor, um, as a test taker. What we see here is a breakdown of a writing section, which on SAT would be section two. Uh, this is not the one you saw earlier because this person did miss a few. We can see seven incorrect expression of ideas questions and seven incorrect SEC standard of English conventions questions, which we'll talk about in a moment. 
If I saw that, uh, I would look a little bit more closely at where did we miss questions? Were they at the end of the section or were they all throughout? I don't know if there's timing issues, but clearly the two topics that are worth attacking first, maybe three, because commas and clauses are related, would be these two. So clauses being about punctuation rules, independent versus dependent, uh, ING verbs, kind of things we haven't thought about as high school students in a long time, versus very different question types like accomplish a task, which are not grammar related. So what sounds good is out the window. For those questions, it'll be, oh, I've got a job to do. And so it'd be thinking about how do we get to think more like the test writers when we're doing that job. So this kind of breakdown can really tell us a lot about where we need to work to raise that score. Let's take a closer look at reading. And to me, reading, and I'm always coming from the tutor's perspective, it is the most interesting and difficult and challenging section to teach because everyone's different. So I'll give you the basics and then just acknowledge that there's not a one size fits all strategy. Appworth has some good techniques, but they have to be tweaked for each student. Uh, 65 minutes for 52 questions is a lot slower paced than ACT. Out of the five passages, one of them will be a comparison passage, meaning there'll be a passage A and B, and then questions at the end to compare them. And the skills tested are what you would expect. So comprehension, of course. How do we find evidence in the passage? What do we infer? Uh, vocab, which comes up a couple times per passage. And then describing data, which are just graphs. So matching to graphs. What we work on as, uh, or in session would be, let's make notes in the margins, right? So what kind of notes are going to help me really dissect the main purpose and come back and access it? Uh, we'll also work on eliminating answer choices the writers put in intentionally to be wrong. And then for inference, it would be more about when do we make an inference and when do we decide not to be subjective? And there's enough objective common sense evidence. So a lot of this is readings about getting to know the tests and how the test writers operate. Here's a little snapshot of how the reading mock test report would look. You can see on passage one, which is always LIT literature. So the first patch of the SAT is always literary narrative. That's good to know. Uh, I see this person being pretty strong with literature. So I wouldn't tell that student, hey, skip and start with a different passage type, which we might say in a different instance. Uh, HSS is history, social science, and politics. That will be passages two and four, but they'll be very different because the politics passage is going to be about women's suffrage or civil rights or slavery and usually is uh, dated back to the 1800s or earlier, so it'll be confusing language. Then you've got SCI, which is just natural science, passages three and five. And then comparison, which again, we don't know which one that will be. So HSSC would mean passage two or four was the comparison passage this time. That's the one dynamic that always changes. We never know where the comparison passage is. It could be first, second, third, fourth, or fifth. But otherwise, this the order is fairly predictable. You don't have to go one through five if we don't want to. The other thing about SAT that's super different, and honestly, probably the fundamental difference on the reading section, is the SAT what has, it has what's called EBQs, or evidence-based question pairs. And so this is a kind of silly example. But what we notice is the first question is a normal question. The second one has lines that says, which choice provides the best evidence for the answer to the previous question? These pairs make up 40% of SAT reading questions. So again, these EBQ pairs like this make up 40% of SAT reading questions. So they're really, really important. We have some strategies we can use to attack them. Again, different things can work for different people. But if you're getting four of these out of 10 questions per passage, we need to make sure that this is something that people are comfortable with and understand also just they exist. What you don't want to do is do question five and then flip to the next page and realize, oh, crap, that was paired with six, right? So it's, sometimes it's just important to identify that they're there and circle them at the outset. The big question when you get an SAT mock test or real test back is where do I lose points? So what you'll also see on the mock report is where we lost points, missed question types, uh, number of raw points lost, and you can translate that then to score. 
and that can then inform what you do before your next test. So in this case, evidence-based questions cost us five, but by far the bigger things to focus on would be the vocab and the data. Why? Well, because we missed five out of probably 20 evidence-based questions, but there's only about five vocab questions and maybe about five graph questions. So that means this person missed the majority of those. So that would be the easiest thing to knock out is let's go look at vocab. What are we doing for these? And how are we matching graphs? Do we need a different strategy? So even though it seems like evidence-based questions is the most missed, if you actually think about it, it's probably lower priority than the other two topics. And also more difficult. So what we do in look, looking through a mock test report is look for patterns. A string of guesses or omits, meaning we deleted, means maybe we lost time or maybe just lost energy or interest in the material. It's important to always guess. So just don't, don't leave anything blank because there are no points off for wrong answers on these tests. Uh, if we see like in the middle of a section, a cluster of wrong answers or questions we deleted, maybe that was just that passage we didn't like. Uh, same thing, if there's one passage with low accuracy, maybe we save that for last, right? So like if literature isn't my thing or it's taking too long or I'm not doing great with it, I won't do it first, even though it's passage one. Sometimes taking control over the order in which we do things is actually in itself a good thing for a test taker because it gives you agency and sometimes with that comes confidence and crispness. Always looking for patterns. We're going to move on to writing. And so that is section two. Again, if you have questions about reading, go ahead and put them in the, the Q&A and I will get to them. Um, let me try to think if there's anything else I'm reading I want to just point out before we move on. I think the big thing would be that last bullet point. We are better at things we like. We're better at things we enjoy and are interested in. So if you start the test in the section with a passage that's really just a slog, like, oh man, 18th century literature passage about something I don't care about. It's usually two pages out of a novel. So no plot development, just characters. If you're a person who does better with facts and wants to start off crisply with some, maybe a cushion for time, start with passages three and five on the SAT. Those are the both the natural science passages. We can rely on that. And they're very fact-based and can be fast-paced. We'll come back to reading. Let's talk writing. Uh, usually, not always, but usually the easiest section to improve because it's just full of rust. It's full of things that people have learned when they were kids and have lost somehow in a high school career, or we've been using it incorrectly since then. 44 questions, which is four 11 question passages. 35 minutes total means you get 845 per passage. And in my experience, timing isn't usually a huge issue on this section of this test. What do we need to know? So grammar, standard English conventions like punctuation rules, verb tense, pronouns, misplaced modifiers, a tough topic. And then the other thing is totally different question type make up about half of them, which is expression of ideas. That's the rhetoric where we've got to add or delete information, where the author wants to move sentence three, where should it go? Much more involved, much different. Uh, but I mean, there's simple rules. So one rule that is very easy on the SAT is semicolon equals a period. So in, in real grammar, maybe that's not true. There's semicolons must connect related independent clauses. But for our purposes, if there's a full sentence before and a full sentence after, this is exactly the same as this. And those are good clues because then if you see an answer with a semicolon and one with a period that hasn't changed anything else, they're both wrong because they can't both be right. So there's a combination of simple rules and then trusting our ear and just getting practice. In. But semicolons on this test are exactly the same as periods. That's a nice easy rule. Here's an example of a rhetoric question, which asks students to really change the quality of the sentence and prove it. A minute to look at it. You can try it. On the real test, you have passage on the left, questions on the right. Most people will benefit from just going right to left. So I haven't really read yet. I'll just go to this question. At the underlined point, 
what does the writer want to do? The writer wants to provide specific information about her brother's hobbies. Unlike on reading, where paraphrasing is an important skill and kind of putting it in your own terms is helpful, on this, you don't want to do that. We want to be objective robots, so provide specific information about hobbies. That is our only job. Yes, we'll read for context, but there's only one answer that is remotely specific about the hobbies. So I need to be able to look at that choice and say, okay, here's what his hobbies were. Here's what he liked to do. This is the only possibility because no change is vague. Things I find boring or games I like, that's not specific. Same with C, same with D. So these questions, if people know what to look for, can be the easiest thing. However, if you come at it thinking grammar, thinking I need a short answer or I need something that fits well and you don't stick true to the question, then it can be difficult. So just understanding that this is boilerplate language and what matters is the word specific in this case. I will get you your answer. Other things we might have to do, we might have to combine sentences or thoughts, might have to move sentences around, rearrange, and then add delete is another pretty common question type that we see. So yeah, B, slam dunk answer for that question. Here's what a mock test report would look like. Uh, again, this is just the first 14 out of 44 questions. But what I see is this person started out a little rocky, but then really hit their stride on question six. And uh, based on the top missed question types, it looks like a complicated task is something we're going to be going over. That doesn't mean we won't look at numbers two and four, but I don't think that those necessarily are problem areas. That just might be that question was weird. How do we fix it for next time? How do we, if you see it again, know what to do? So very much like reading when you see the breakdown here. Getting into a bit more about what are rhetoric, what are, what's grammar, what's rhetoric. So about half the questions, like we said, pronouns, possession, punctuation, parallelism, some things that don't start with P, uh, subject verb agreement, modifiers. All of those have rules that most sophomores, juniors, seniors in high school have either forgotten or just don't really employ that much. And so that's something that's often pretty easy to, to knock out early. And then it's just a matter of practice and looking at what makes these answers wrong, right? So usually two very bad answers and then finding the one that the writers want you to pick. The rhetoric questions, it's important to just identify them as different. So we're going from, oh, short and sweet. I like an answer that sounds good to then a rhetoric question where that doesn't matter. There you're asking, does it flow smoothly? So does it transition? Uh, does it stay on topic? Should you add it? Where should it be moved? And the hard part there is remaining objective. Because people will look at that and think, well, isn't that dependent on your writing style or what you like? And it could be, but we have to think about the thousands of people taking the same test. They have the same clues on the page as you. And so it's a matter of what were the writers trying to get me to see? What's the tag in this sentence? It starts with he, it must come after a male. Or it starts with therefore, so it must show a, a cause effect transition. So it's about honing in on individual words to see what were the test writers trying to get me to see. It's all about the test writer's point of view. So one question we ask when we get a mock back is where do we have room to grow? Where are the available points? Uh, this one would say clauses is a big one. I mean, for a lot of students, that's the case. And they're all, it's also the most common question type. So to me, maybe missing three vocab and three order placement is more important because there aren't that many of those. That's like three out of five that they're missing versus four out of 10 clauses questions. So again, it, it takes kind of a, a closer look to see what types of questions am I struggling with? Uh, and there's just a lot of patterns, a lot of repetition. You do a few of these, you get to see what these questions look like and what correct answers and wrong answers look like. So this person actually seems like they're kind of split between grammar and rhetoric, some issues on each. Speaking of patterns, if we see multiple misses on accomplish a task, well, or on punctuation, well, maybe that's a rule to tweak. We need reinforcement. That is pretty obvious, I think. Uh, and then in terms of particular questions, if you are missing rhetoric rather than grammar, we're going to figure out why. It's usually people are thinking too hard. They're working hard. They're actually reading the passage. Don't do that. Just look at word matches and kind of robotically accomplish your, your task. 
So patterns will tell us what we need to focus on and then what kind of skills we need to develop or hone to succeed, to get better. Closer look at the math sections. So we've got section three and section four. Here's the time breakdown. On both sections, uh, the questions tend to get harder as they go. So you'll find the first five on no calc to be pretty easy, uh, but then like 11 through 15, the last few multiple choice are very hard. But then you get to the grid-ins, 16 through 20, and they tend to be easier. So one easy thing on no calc math is maybe do one through eight and then do 16 through 20, or at least some of those because they reset and then come back and try nine through 15. That's smart for a couple of reasons. One is prioritize easy points that are worth the same amount. The other is if I run out of time or energy and I have to guess, you're not going to guess correctly unless you're very lucky on a grid right? Because you're guessing from every positive number in the world versus nine through 15, that's A, B, C, D. If I have to guess, I've got a one in four shot at worst. So not only are these harder, but you want to finish with them because if you do have to guess, you might guess right, right? Making sure we get to those student produced responses on both sections is important. Um, the last section, some people have time issues on this one, no calc. Uh, the last one, most people don't, but it is kind of a grueling long section to end with. Section one is reading 65 minutes. Section four is math 55 minutes. Uh, here you do get the calculator and you'll find I don't really need it versus here. It's like, I wish I had my calculator. There are formulas at the beginning of each section, which aren't tested that often, but special right triangles and other geometry formulas are given at the beginning of both of these. Very different from ACT, which is you get math is section two on ACT. You get 60 questions, 60 minutes in the calculator the whole time and no grid in this. But ACT has got five multiple choice. The SAT only has four, A, B, C, D. So let's take another dive into this stuff. What do they test? I mean, SAT is more finite than ACT. Arithmetic, you're seeing stuff like piece over whole, that's uh, arc length and probability and ratios and proportions and percentages. Uh, you also see unit conversion, which is something that a lot of people do a lot of in school, so we don't do a whole lot of that in tutoring. The stuff that's really the heart of it is algebra, lines, functions, parabolas, factoring, zeros, intercepts, solutions, systems, things that most students know, but if, they, if they're, let's say, a rising senior and they just took calculus BC, they're not thinking about this stuff. When they think functions, they're thinking something way, way more difficult. So a lot of it's bringing people back to earth and saying, let's make this as simple as possible. Right, this was freshman year, not just now. Uh, and then a little bit of statistics stuff. So study design or data analysis, but that's mostly fairly straightforward, teachable, even if you haven't had stats. And then basic modeling is a big part of the SAT. That is about real world scenarios translating to math and vice versa. So seeing a, a slope intercept equation and being able to translate that into a real life situation. That's all about plugging the numbers. Geometry and trig aren't tested that much on the SAT. There's a little bit, but it's mostly basic trig and basic geometry. And like I said, there are formulas that we can use at the beginning of each test. ACT, much more geometry and trig heavy. This isn't everything, but that's some of the basics. You also see stuff like absolute value, inequalities, and random things. Here's an example of someone who did not follow the advice of make sure you get to the grittens. And here they left five points on the table, three of which were probably pretty easy. 16, 17, 18 are usually pretty easy. What I suggest to students is when they hit a wall or it starts to get hard, maybe that's at six or seven or by 10 usually, that's when you jump to 16 through 20 and try to knock those out. Because again, even if you're guessing on these, you're probably gonna get a few right. And this person didn't have time to even bubble in for 14 or 15. So this is actually not a bad result, but this person can do much better if they just attacked the first 10 and then decided, all right, I'm gonna leave these. I'm gonna leave 11 through 15 for later. If I can get to them, great. If not, I'll just guess A on each of them and get one right. And make sure, make sure you get to these. 
So yeah, that'd be the big thing that we noticed there is this is pretty, you're pretty good at math, but you gotta make sure that you pace yourself correctly so that you get to this. Well, you'll see on NoCalc, a lot of functions, a lot of algebra, uh, and manipulating algebraic expressions, al algebra is all about just changing things, make it look different. Uh, take a look at this question. So people can try it out if they want, and we'll talk about how we might approach it. Most of my students actually do struggle with this one initially. Here's what I often see is I see people usually thinking, okay, well, I see y equals x minus three squared, so I have to expand that in FOIL, which actually is a good thing to remember that you're supposed to expand in FOIL. Okay, x squared minus six x plus nine. Then I look at the answers, and what we should notice is this doesn't look good. <laughs> I don't see anything, I can't get this. I think FOILing was the wrong move. So with SAT and with algebra, we have to be ready to pivot. It's almost always a simple solution. This really was a question number one on a test, so it really should be simple. So maybe instead we take a different look and just look at the answers and see if, if, if we can prove them. So is y always less than three? Like, would that make sense? Could I pick a number for x to make that not true? And yeah, I mean, if I picked x was like 10, 10 minus three is seven, seven squared is 49. So if y could equal 49, a is not true. Y is always greater than three, I better keep because 49 is greater than three. Same with this. And right now, same with this because 49 is bigger than 10. My brightest students will tend to not like this because it doesn't feel mathy. But the next move is like, well, can I disprove any of these three answers? And the answer is yes. What if you just plug in X is three? Three minus three is zero. Zero squared is zero. So when X is three, Y is zero. We have now disproven answer choice B. So it's not always greater than three. And it's also not always greater than X. We disproved that as well. The weird part here is why they pick negative two rather than negative one. Because all this squared tells you is that no matter what comes out of this, no matter what comes out of that, it's going to be minimum zero. It will not be negative. It's going to be zero or a positive number. And so I think with this one, it just looks different than it ends up being. That's pretty typical of SAT math. It's like, what do I need to do to make this easy? What am I solving for? What do I know? And then what's my first step? If we have those down, we're pretty good on SAT math. Here's a calculator section breakdown. So again, got to make sure we get to the gridings, right? This, this student really had trouble in this 19 to 29 range. This is the tough stuff, right? And actually what I, I think here, this may be a PSAT. So take this with a grain of salt. This is a calculator PSAT section. So there's only four gridings. So what we'll take away from this page is that you can see the types of questions we're missing. And here, there's not too many big, patterns that I see at all. So what I want to do is take care of these early questions. Why are you missing these basic algebra, trend spotting, systems questions early? Those are worth the same amount of these tough ones, but we got to get there. So always prioritizing the early questions. This would be the calculator math section. So here's kind of a horrifying statistic and question that we can look at. Another one that I have a lot of people miss or struggle with. I can't vouch for the veracity of this statement, but usually SAT does give true facts. So Americans eat an average of 1,500 hamburgers every second. 45% of all hamburgers are eaten in the Southeast. And we're meant to not solve anything but show which equation represents the total number of burgers Americans in the Southeast eat in M minutes. When you see 
all of that stuff in variables, a lot of people are going to jump to two answers, which are usually these two, B and C. The question then becomes, how do I convert those units? A lot of people remember minutes over 60 is one way to do it. But in this case, if we think about one minute, in one minute, will it be 1,500 hamburgers or will it be more than that? Well, it's a 1,500 every second. So in one minute, it should actually be 60 times 1,500. And notice that if you plugged one into choice C, it would make sense. The math would work out in one minute, 60 times 1,500, and then times the 45% for the Southeasterners. Versus B would be incorrect because we don't want to divide by 60. That would then mean in a minute, there are fewer burgers eaten than in a second. And that would not make sense. I think this is a pretty hard question, very abstract, best made, I think, relatable by picking numbers. Again, one minute, what would happen? So just think about it realistically. Uh, that tends to be some of the harder stuff to learn and to teach is the modeling and just understanding that no matter what, you can plug in zero or one and just translate from words into math and vice versa. So modeling is a big part of the SAT. And we've talked about the SPRs, which we don't really refer to them. That. These are gridens or gridables, as some of my, my kids say. Uh, you get four total units. There are no negatives, so you can't grid in a negative. You can do fractions or decimals. Sometimes we have to round. Uh, but again, these are the questions we've got to get to because they reset in difficulty, and we can't really guess on them. Here, again, if you looked at a re report and saw available points, where can we gain points? You want to target areas that look like we lost a lot of points. Equation of a line is traditionally a very common and not that tough topic. So that would be something that we would focus on. And then modeling as well, because it's related. Other than that, I don't see anything major or red flags, uh, maybe exponent stuff, because those were early. But you can learn a lot from these reports. So just, go, go, just going back through questions is probably the number one thing uh, a high school student could do is taking mock tests and working back through questions they missed, seeking help from a tutor maybe only if, if they, there are questions they don't know how to do, right? So some students benefit from that, others need that more kind of hands-on planning approach. But uh, some of the highest scoring students I've had, at least towards the end of our sessions, would just say, okay, here's the ones I missed, I'm gonna go through them on my own. Anything that stands out as difficult, that's what we'll start with next time. That's a really good way to improve your score, pretty foolproof just mostly because SATs are similar. They're not going to change much from one test to another. I think we may have proven this, but being able to solve math on this test is often subordinate or less important than being able to generate an equation or just interpret what's going on. So for this one, it's important to remember that f of x just means y. These are just x, y points. We could picture them on a graph or we could just think of them as like, this is negative five, zero, right? And this one's one, six and so on. The question is which could define F, meaning which of these answers is a correct interpretation of the X, Y points given? Look at the zeros. So for this one, we'd be kind of reviewing solutions, intercept zeros. When X is negative five, Y is zero. When X is zero, Y is zero at the origin. And the same right there. This would then bring back some algebra factoring and understanding, well, what would get you a solution of x equals negative 5? Would it be x minus 5 or x plus 5? Because we want the value of x that would make y 0, we need to be x plus 5. So that one's wrong. Then we would look at positive 2. So that would mean that we need x minus 2 there. And we have that in all three of our choices. And then just looking at the point zero, zero, well, that means that X is a factor. So it can't be B. The last step would be how the heck am I supposed to pick between these two without doing much math? And the answer is pick a non-intercept point and plug it in. So the point one, six, if you plug in one for X, will we get six? And what I believe happens is this one gets you negative six, but C gets you positive six. 
That is not the only way to do this question. Some people are probably looking at this thinking, well, yeah, I mean, there's it's an odd function or uh, thinking about the behavior of the graph. But the point is that there's options and there's almost always an easy, easy, simple solution. In this case, it's all about realizing I'm supposed to be looking at the zeros and how factored form relates to that. So I don't think that's an easy question. Uh, I think it would be on a no calculator section, probably not that we would use the calculator, but there's a lot of really good stuff here about f of x and zeros and factors that would really be at the heart of SAT math. So I'm glad we put this question. As always, when you're looking at your results, look for patterns. So if we have wrong answers early, that's often careless mistake or just a, a, a topic I knew but forgot. If we leave stuff at the end, either is fatigue, mental stamina is a huge part of this test, or it could be the questions are just getting harder and I didn't skip around to stuff I liked, or it could be timing. And then, um, yeah, biggest error is we don't translate correctly. We look at the X is zero instead of the Y, or just simple little mistakes. There's so many ways to go wrong. So translation from words to math is definitely a big part of SAT math. Let's talk how to register. And we'll talk also about like what the dates are uh, and maybe hopefully ease some fears if some of you are rising seniors, like you've got time. But sat.org or collegeboard.org will take you to the same place. It is not the most fun website. Uh, it is a little bit hard to navigate. They'll log you out occasionally. But you go there, create an account. Most people will already have one. And then go in and register for the official exam. Uh, if you're a rising junior, senior, or really just if you're anyone, your next opportunity to take this test is the end of August. I want to say August 27th. Yep. You still have quite a bit of time to register for that. The big key is in certain parts of the country, test centers fill up really fast. Like in Seattle, it's insane. I have students who are going to Idaho and going to Oregon and just going to California to take SATs. So make sure that you get on that early, especially for yeah, West. Yeah, I think really Seattle is the worst for SAT. Uh, just they fill up so fast, but that's really the key of registering early is just find a test center near you so that you're not waking up and driving a couple hours. That's not in the world if you do it, but it's always nice to have somewhere nearby or somewhere you're familiar with. And you can see you've got uh, SATs in October, November, and December of this year, as is the case every year. What's right for you? Well, no matter who you are, almost everyone should take the test more than once. Uh, it's very, very rare to be one and done. It also puts unneeded pressure on students, I think. So just thinking, oh, I've got to get this score on this test. Not only is that somewhat unlikely because it's often the first testing center experience and there are nerves and it's just, it's hard, it's the first one. But knowing that you've got more cracks at it down the road is often really helpful. So like first test is kind of almost a practice run Second one, we're looking to boost scores in a section or two. Uh, and then third one, we're fine tuning and just trying to get to our, our uh, goal score. Two tests can do it, but yeah, usually it's three. I would plan on trying to prep for and register for three. If you're doing individual studying or tutor, uh, what you want to do is work backwards from your last official tests. Make sure you're going into each one with confidence, with momentum. That's really our big goal in tutoring is making sure they're going in feeling good. And on that note, so there are other reasons to take it more than once. Super scoring for ACT is big, for SAT too though. Here's how that works. I think probably easiest here would be just to illustrate like what happened to me. Is I took the test, I got a 710 on verbal. This is when it was a different test, but 710 and 710. So 1420, no prep, I was pretty fine with that, but I wanted to take it again to see if I could do better. I took it again and I actually did much, much worse in this section, but I went up to 770 here and well, thought, well, damn, I got a 1420 again. Here's the thing, even back then, most colleges or at least a half of them or so were super scoring, meaning I would submit both of these test scores and the colleges at super score would only see this. They wouldn't know that I took it twice, they wouldn't see 1420, they would see, oh, Tal has a 710 and a 770 for a 1480 composite. That is what super scoring is. It's incredibly powerful. So like, I don't ever encourage only focus on this section. That's not usually a good idea, 
But if we know we need to boost one, not the other, because we're perfect on verbal, that's huge, right? And just variation from test to test, maybe one day I was tired and I didn't do as well on the last two sections. Um, the next time I do better. So super scoring is a really big factor for why we take this test more than once. And again, third time's often the charm. Uh, I think setting goals is also important and, and being ready to change them because it's often at the beginning, we don't know how strong we actually are. We've got this baseline score, but no prep. So I don't always want to commit to a score increase goal until we've seen a couple of tests or a couple of sessions to really understand how, how far can we push this? How, how high can we go on this test? Talking about super scoring a bit more, uh, they do mention the ACT here. So again, on Thursday, we're gonna have a presentation about that. And basically the rule is that ACT doesn't now require you to submit multiple tests. They have this new method of super scoring uh, and submitting to colleges. For score reports in general, what you guys should know is that you can, when you register for an SAT, send free score reports to colleges, about five of them, I think but you won't know your score yet. So what a lot of people tend to do is they just wait, go through the college counselor and send after, like during application process at the beginning of senior year or in the summer before senior year, um, because it's minimal, it's negligible cost compared to the rest of this stuff. It's like eight or 10 bucks, I think usually, or maybe 20 per score send. So even if you're applying to 10 schools, it might be worth that $200 to wait and make sure you're sending the scores that you know of that you wanna send. Otherwise, when you register for the first test, if you already had sent this, it wouldn't be the end of the world because you have other scores that superimpose those. But I do think that these days, oftentimes until you're sure of about where you're at, you probably don't want to send the scores yet. Uh, you can also always supplement a college application with the score. So if you've got it pretty much done, and you've done your personal statements at all, and then you take the test or take another test, you can add that in. So we'll talk a bit more about that now, I think. So yeah, that's the theme, don't worry. If you haven't started yet, there's still time. It's okay to test in the summer between junior and senior year. You can take the August SAT and then you've got cracks at October, November, December. December's a little bit late for college apps, but October, November, probably okay, as long as we're not doing early decision. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just, it's one of those things that people get so stressed about it, but there's always more opportunities to take it. So a lot of this is, remember, test scores don't define you. And it's just one of those things where even if you feel like you're in a time crunch, you're not alone and, and it can be done, I promise. We talk a lot about just what tests to take and yes, that comes into like when, where are we in school, but it's also about if you've got a sport and the championships are in October, we're not taking the October SAT, it doesn't make sense. Uh, versus maybe it's a calm time. If you're a super high score, the PSAT is in October and the PSAT is just basically the SAT, except that verbal counts double. Uh, it doesn't matter for most people, but if someone's a very high scorer, maybe we take the October PSAT and SAT, and maybe November, and try to be done. Uh, you want to be sure that prep's not going to overload your schedule because I know that high schoolers now just work so, so hard, uh, especially junior years. It's really tough. And then summer can be best time for tutoring because of that. So my busy season is about to start because finally just kids can sleep and have a little bit of time to do some work on, on test prep. If possible, finish testing before early application deadlines, which I believe are like September, August, September. Um, so ideally we finish testing completely and have our scores that we want before that. It doesn't work out that way all the time, but that's the ideal. This is true. I mean, it may fall on deaf ears. Uh, I remember a lot of procrastinating and cramming in high school for tests. This is just not your typical test. And so like, I really can't say this enough. Cramming is not an effective method. It will not help you on this test. Uh, this is not a matter of what do I know? How many things do I have to memorize? It's how well do I know the test? How much can I think like the test writers, right? We need to know what to expect. And that's a bit of a process. It's not something you can do overnight. Uh, I tell my students Thursday, Friday before the test, you should be focusing on not getting sick and getting good sleep because that will do much more than any sort of cramming work to do. And of course, as I've said before, every student's different. So we do academic tutoring, we do test prep, which is my forte, and then executive function coaching. Uh, I'm going to pull up the email here in a second, but 866-789-PREP is the phone number. 
some options. So self-paced online course, which is relatively new. We've got these great online materials, uh, videos, exercises. The instructional design team at Apple Ruth is honestly incredible, like nothing I've ever seen. I worked with them for several years in Atlanta and they're really, really amazing and they care and they, and they have fun lessons and it's really impressive. We use those, of course, for group and private tutoring as well. And you can reach out to Apple Ruth. Uh, I don't, they, they'll tell you about the 10, 20, 30 hour packages, pricing, um, scheduling, and how it all works. And it's June, so we're doing our promo. Ends at the end of the month. Uh, you can save up to 1500 on test prep, up to 340 on tutoring. It's a good deal. You can get like, I think uh, for every 10 hours, you get a free one, something like that. Um, and so summer is often the time where you're seeing a lot of people buy tutoring. We've got a few minutes, I believe. Yep. So um, questions, I will be happy to answer any of them that I can. Uh, feel free to put them in the Q&A and I'll give you guys a few minutes and see what comes up. Of course, don't feel pressured to answer questions. If you feel like you've gotten what you need, feel free to dip out. Uh, it's been a pleasure presenting and I hope you got some out of it. And again, if you're looking for information on the ACT, There'll be a bit of overlap, but that's on Thursday. And I think that's going to be also a really good way just to tell which test might be better for you. I want to get a copy of this recording. Thank you. Albert's going to answer that. Very well. Thank you. Let's leave it open for a couple minutes. Here we go. Oh, I brought the Princeton Review SAT Premium Prep 2023 book. Okay, these are a couple of good questions. So first I'm gonna answer um, the Princeton Review question. It depends on where you're at in school. I think the best time to start prep if you're a high scorer would be summer after sophomore year, assuming you've taken algebra two at least. Um, I'm also very biased towards Apple Ruth prep materials. I think Princeton Review has some great stuff, but uh, the way our design team works, they're really on the cutting edge of what the test is. I still think if you were going to start prep, no matter what you do, I'd probably dive in beginning of junior year, end of junior year, or some before junior year, depending on your schedule. I think any of those would be okay. So think about which test you're going to take, work backwards from those. And then, Mike, is the essay optional or not required anymore? The essay is not required anymore for SAT. The SAT writing portion no longer exists. Mercifully, it is not a thing anymore, uh, which is good because I think test scorers and admissions officers didn't really know what to do with it. So personal statements more important. Uh, no SAT writing. It does not exist. There is an ACT writing portion, but it's optional and very rarely done. Um, question of uh, free lessons for SAT prep. So Khan Academy has free information and there are definitely available uh, tests. So like SAT tests on Khan uh, has really, really good stuff. Um, the Apple Ruth book and the self-study is a good way to do it for cheap and really get the best out of it. So, but yeah, uh, unfortunately, I wish there was more opportunity for free SAT prep or for you know low-income students. That's something that I think is, is does contribute to some of the gap uh, in admissions. But yeah, there, there are definitely ways to study online. Khan Academy is a good starting point. And then last question I think is August 27th test. So right now we're early June, you've got two months, two and a half months. Um, if August 27th is your first test, your first official SAT, and you haven't done much prep yet, I would do, if I was doing tutoring, I think 10 hours between now and then, if I was just doing on my own, I would aim for like an hour of work, not every day, but every two or three days. I think that between now and then would get you there, um, especially if you're targeted. So I, I wouldn't wait too long to start, uh, but yeah, an hour a day individually every other day, and then plus some tutoring or mock tests as needed. All right, I think we're at time. Um, it's been fun doing this. I'll be back on Thursday for ACT and hope you guys all have a wonderful night.